Okay, make sure that's going on. Okay, well, hello and welcome to our monthly Women in Technology of the Heartland virtual meetup. Happy IT Professional Day. I think, I didn't even know that was a day today. Thank you, Stephanie, for the information. But again, if you know, donuts can have a, an international day, then why not IT professionals, right? So happy international day. Um, so thank you uh, for all those who are joining us today. The Women of Technology of the Heartland has um, also known as WIT, uh, has been founded in 2012. Our mission is to connect, empower, support, and share opportunities with the goal of advancing women in technology. So again, if you're just joining us, let's fire up that chat box. Let us know where you're joining us from. I wish we were all in person, but again, grateful for the opportunity to connect through technology. And so um, my name is Monica Philip. I'm the director of tech leadership development at the AIM Institute. Um, I've been with, uh, with for about a year and a half or so. I love all the women that I get to co-organize with. And so make sure if you haven't done so yet, uh, go on our website, sign up for a newsletter. We have a lot of announcements and updates monthly. So uh, make sure to do that. Um, that's it from me. I'm going to go ahead and pass it to Jeannie for announcements and our sponsors. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Welcome. Uh, let me introduce the planning committee members that are here, and I believe they're all here. Um, Gina Havlovic, Colleen Schinker, Rachel Caldwell, Stephanie Hickey, Susan Haller, Robin Messerly, Amity Collars, Anna Verhoff, Apologies if I'm mispronouncing your name. Jane Leahy, Pam Hagee, Lauren Phipps, Kathy Ludwig, Maria Brady, Mary Kyle, and Nezzy Hardages. You already know Monica Phillips, and my name is Jeannie Spence. I also want to thank the sponsors, AIM, for hosting our Zoom link and for sponsoring two of our raffle items. You must be present to win, so stay after, oh. stay until the end. And then CSS Staffing for sponsoring one of the raffle items as well. Thank you to Monica and Stephanie for helping me organize this meeting. AIM is a non for profit that grows, connects, and inspires a diverse tech talent throughout community throughout um, the Omaha area. And actually, I believe it's more national. And CSS Staffing is a national IT recruiting and placement firm. Last month was our first hybrid meeting. It was great. We had about 35 people live at Farm Credit Services building in West Omaha and another 30 plus online. Content was really well received, very valuable and facility is top notch. Our next month's meeting is a topic that's near to everybody's heart, security with Lisa McKee from Protivity sponsored by ECHO and it will be on October 19th. Depending on CDC guidelines, we may do a hybrid or we may remain virtual. As Monica mentioned, today is National IT Professionals Day. Um, Facebook has another announcement. Facebook's updated their data center website. The URL, I'll put the URL in the um, chat window after I'm done introducing the speaker. AIM is offering two scholarship opportunities to share with the group, and I'll put these in the chat window as well. The first is an Emerging Tech Leadership Academy, and the second are, is called Advanced Tech Leadership Academy, and applications are open through the end of the month. There are two raffle, three raffle items. Two of them are tickets to the Heartland Developers Conference, and the third is a, an Amazon gift certificate. On to the speaker. So Jessica Coder is a software engineer at UP Railroad, specializing in UI development for the past 12 years. She leads the Software Quality Assurance Guild at UP, helps train new hires, and organizes tech talks for her team and department. She's an active member of Toastmasters International, a communication and leadership skills development group, and has earned the Distinguished Toastmaster Award, winning the 2021 Humor Speech Contest and she serves as their PR manager. She's spoken at a number of different organizations, including on topics uh, related to software development, I'm sorry, software frameworks, mentoring, design principles, and she's excited to share the intersection of her technical and her communication expertise with a presentation on communication no. and collaboration in technology. Please help me welcome Jessica Coder. Let's Jessica. go ahead and unmute and give it up for Jessica. Go ahead, unmute everyone. Woo! Hey! Hey! hey. Welcome, hey, Jessica. I'm definitely more used to the silent, the silent applause, but I appreciate the shout outs. 
How many of you have ever been on a project that was less successful than it could have been? Anyone, anyone on projects that didn't go quite as well as you had hoped? I think we've all been there at one point or another. I challenge you to think about how often those challenges to our projects are purely technical and how often there's an aspect of communication and collaboration breakdowns involved. I would contend that even when issues seem technical, the heart of the problem is communication or collaboration, finding the right people to help you, communicating the requirements clearly, getting on the same page with your team and with the people who are going to be using your software. These are the problems that I most frequently encounter and so I've come up with what I hope are some tips to help us in that area of communication and collaboration. They have certainly helped me and I think they will help you as well. Tonight, we are going to talk about five things. We're going to talk about setting expectations, enabling participation, verifying understanding, documenting decisions, and the all important step to keep improving. Let's start by setting expectations. In this talk, I am going to cover those five areas that I just mentioned. If you have a question, I encourage you to use the raise hand reaction that I saw one of you use earlier to get my attention, or you can type your question in the chat. I'll be watching that as well. We'll also be having an open discussion at the end of the presentation. So if you have more general comments or tips or ideas that you would like to share, you will have a chance to do so then. My goal through all of this is for each of us to leave here tonight with at least one actionable tip that we can take back and apply for ourselves or our teams. Now I've set expectations for the talk. I've gone over how our interactions will work, what I'm going to cover, and what the overall goal is. And that expectation setting is critical to do for your technical projects as well. Identifying how your team will communicate and collaborate will help you work together more effectively. And knowing what your goal is, is really the only way to achieve that goal and to be successful in your project. For example, in my team at Union Pacific, we set norms and standards for how we will communicate with one another. We have a daily scrum call that we all know to get on so that we can discuss what we've done the day before, what we're going to do today, and what blockers we might have or challenges we might need help overcoming. That concept of scrum is an established part of the agile process, and it's a communication best practice that we apply on our team. We also know that we can send each other messages in Microsoft Teams, that's the messaging framework we use at Union Pacific, and we have each other's personal phone numbers in case there's some sort of emergency situation and we need to contact somebody else when they are not reachable through that Teams channel. So we have these communication channels and regular meetings scheduled and that's the expectation is that people will attend those meetings and use those communication channels. We also have clear goals that we set for the specific projects that we're working on. The specific project that I'm currently working on has to do with train stops. Believe it or not, there are times when trains stop moving before they get to their final destination. And we tend not to like that on the railroad. We would prefer that trains keep moving and get to their destinations promptly so that we can deliver goods to our customers in a timely manner. We also don't like having to stop and start trains because it burns excess fuel. So with all of this in mind, I'm working on a project with a goal to reduce the number and duration of train stops that occur on our network. It's a clear goal. And there is a clear reason why we want to do that. It's also a rather large goal. So I have focused in on a more narrow piece of it. I am specifically trying to collect data on existing train stops 
to find out why trains are stopping. And in order to do that, I am getting feedback from our train dispatchers. Train dispatchers are like the air traffic controllers of the railroad. They keep track of trains, where they're moving, where they're supposed to be going. And there are all kinds of train dispatchers that are responsible for different parts of Union Pacific's territory. So my specific goal in service of that overall goal related to train stops is to get the dispatchers to provide us feedback on every single train stop that occurs on our network. Every time a train stops unexpectedly or for longer than we would like it to, we want to get that information from the dispatchers. So that's my specific goal and getting that data helps us analyze why the trains are stopping so that we can eliminate those causes of stops and meet that overall goal of reducing the number and duration of stops. So I have clear expectations for my project, what I'm going to do, and I'm able to move forward effectively. And the way I moved forward was by creating a screen that I will post in the chat for anyone who would like to take a look at a sample of it. This is a screen that allows the dispatchers to enter the details about why a train is stopped and any additional comments. There's terminology here that is specifically understood by our train dispatchers, but that file gives you an overall idea of what the screen looks like. There's a row for each train stop. If you can't see the file, just imagine a table with a row for each train stop and then columns with information about the particular stop as well as a place for the dispatchers to enter why the train was stopped and any additional comments that they have. It's a relatively straightforward UI, but even when a project seems simple, it's not enough to simply put it out there into the world and hope it works. You need to enable participation from the people who are going to use the product, as well as anyone else who could help you improve the product. In my particular case, I wanted to enable participation from those trained dispatchers. They're the ones who are going to use the screen. And my goal is to get information from them on every train stop. I can't meet my goal without their help, without them using this screen. So I want it to be something that they will want to use. I could try to call them up one by one and ask them to use the screen or ask them for feedback. But that's not very effective because there are a lot of train dispatchers who work for Union Pacific and some of them work in the middle of the night when I would rather be sleeping. I could try sending an email, but how often do people ignore emails? Some train dispatchers don't even check their email regularly while they're on shift, so that's less effective as well. The solution my team and I came up with to enable participation from the train dispatchers was to create a chat room that they could all join and then they could post their comments about the screen, what they liked, what they didn't like, if they saw errors in the data that we were displaying about the train stops, if they needed additional reasons from the dropdown that we give them, anything that comes to their mind. And they can post those comments anytime, day or night, whenever they are able. And the other dispatchers can see the comments so they can build on one another's ideas, they can agree, they can disagree. And I can post responses to say, yes, that's a great idea. I will work on that. And that's awesome. I've actually coded that up and you can see it now if you just refresh your screen. So it's a great, it's been a great way to engage the dispatchers to get their feedback to validate their feedback and to show them that we're acting on their feedback. And we've gotten a lot of very positive reviews of this project. And I think that it is largely due to the fact that we identified the best way to engage the dispatchers and moved forward with that plan. Now, even when you identify one of those avenues for collaboration and communication, you might find there are times when people are not participating as much as you would like. When that happens, it's important to find ways to engage people and make sure that if they want to contribute, that they can contribute. 
some people are just a little more shy and might need that personal request that they add their input. As an example of this, I have a regular retrospective meeting with my team at Union Pacific. We get together online and we talk about what we did well, what we can do better, any sort of general discussions we want to have about our team dynamics. And there are definitely some people on the team who talk a lot more than others, who have a lot of ideas they want to share, but it's not fully collaborative if it's just me talking. I want to hear what others have to say as well. And I've noticed that sometimes people will wait to speak until you ask for their opinion. When I notice that happening, but I know that the person is willing to speak, I will simply ask them what they have to add or if they have anything to add. And there have definitely been times where I have gotten a response of, I don't think I have anything. The rest of you have covered it all, except, and then they will share an idea that they would not have otherwise shared simply because I asked them and challenged them to think about what they might have to contribute. Not everyone is going to respond positively to being called on in a meeting, but you can still ask them one-on-one -on -one after a meeting. How did you think that went? Did you have any additional thoughts that you didn't get a chance to share and encourage them to participate and speak up in the next meeting? One final point I want to make in this space of enabling participation is that all of these examples were done purely online. The chat room is online, our retrospectives are online. So even though we are virtual and distant, we can still participate with one another. Even things that we have traditionally done only in person can be done online. For instance, I have participated in a practice known as pair programming. In pair programming, two programmers will sit side by side, working on the same code together on the same computer. One person will be typing, the other person will be speaking aloud, sharing their ideas about what they think should be done. And it's a collaboration technique that allows multiple, two developers to work together on the piece of code so that they can come up with better ideas. And now you have two people who understand the code instead of just one, because you have two people writing it together. In the past, I have always done that pair programming physically in person, having someone over at my desk sitting with me. But now that's not always possible. So instead, I have done remote pair programming with my teammates. I even have a teammate who doesn't live here in Nebraska. She lives in Arizona. So safety concerns aside, sitting side by side is not an option. Instead of physically being together, we'll get on a call like this one, she'll share her screen and we'll walk through the code together that way. And it's been fantastic because we get to work on the code together, she gets to ask questions, I get to share insights, we get to learn from one another, just like we would if we were there in person side by side. Now that's, it's been a lot of information about enabling participation. Who is the brave soul who can raise their hand or type in the chat and sum up one of those one of those points that I made in that section on enabling participation? The part where I challenge you to participate. Well, I think you just made that point in, you know, challenging us to participate. So that was the, that was one of your points is to reach out to people because some, sometimes they're introverts and they, they need a little nudge. Mm -hmm. and, if yes, you're, absolutely. and if you're paying attention as a facilitator, you're looking around. And, uh, you can do that. Thank you, Jessica, thanks for addressing this topic today. Yeah, on our team, we have retrospectives as well, and we've found them very helpful, especially when there's, I don't know, maybe the word conflict is too strong, but if we're just not communicating effectively, if we're interrupting or talking over each other, we can discuss that. We can discuss how, you know, we can take turns giving ideas and being brief about presenting an idea and then letting someone else chime in. 
Absolutely. Yes, and use a method or platform that people will actually use, I see in the chat. I agree with that. I think you've covered all of my main points, and I'm glad to see that you're following along, paying attention, and that you understand the points that I was attempting to make there. And Jessica, so that, that part about using a, a platform, yes. one of the things that I've done and seen done before is giving people a post-it note pad and just asking them for, you know, to write down their ideas and then put them up on the board because sometimes that's really effective in getting everybody to participate and put their, their thoughts down. Yes, absolutely. I, I like that idea. I like the Robin put positive reinforcement when people participate. That's an excellent idea as well. And encouraging people to participate either one-on-one -on -one or in the meeting, virtual board. We've got all kinds of great ideas. And I'm, I'm glad that we've been able to verify understanding of what I was talking about and even take it to the next level and have some new ideas and build on top of those ideas that we already had. So you might notice that when I asked for you to, to recap what I had been talking about, I didn't just ask, does that make sense? I asked you to explain back to me what I had said and even build on what I had said with additional ideas that I'm thrilled to see you all sharing in the chat. And that's a key point I wanna make in that space of verifying understanding. I'm guilty of this too. You wanna make sure someone understands what you said. So you ask them, does that make sense or do you understand? And they'll either say yes or they'll say no. If they say yes, what does that mean? That means either that they think they understand or that they want you to think that they understand. It does not show that they actually understand. That's why it's so important when you're communicating and collaborating with others that you get them to actively participate and repeat back ideas in their own words or build upon those ideas to demonstrate understanding. You can directly ask them to repeat something in their own words like I did, or you can get a little more creative by asking them other leading questions like how would we implement that? Or what will the customers think? What challenges do you see? Any of these can also help you verify that the other person understands what you're talking about and what idea you're bringing to the table. And it's not just about making sure you are understood. True collaboration involves others as we've talked about and encouraging that participation. And a key way to show that you appreciate that people are contributing is to show that you understand what they're saying. So don't be afraid in a meeting, even this one, to raise your hand and put a pause to the discussion and say something like, let me make sure I understand and then repeat the idea in your own words. So verifying understanding is another critical step in that communication and collaboration journey. Now it's one thing to get to that level of understanding in the moment. It's a whole other ball game to keep that understanding going later. How often have you come to a decision, you know you've come to a decision with your team, and then a week later you cannot remember what you all decided you were going to do, or if you do remember what you were going to do, you have no clue why. Those situations happen because we don't document our decisions. If you're anything like me, you are going to forget things if you don't write them down. I have a team lead at Union Pacific who does an excellent job of keeping meeting notes. And I would encourage you whenever you're in a meeting, make sure that someone is taking notes. And if you don't know who's taking notes, it can be you. My team lead will post the notes that he takes out on our team wiki. And each set of notes is labeled with the date the meeting took place and the topic of the meeting so that we can go back and review those notes later. This is great not only for people who attended the meeting to go back and make sure that they understood what was being said and that they agree with the notes that were taken, but it can also help those who were not present to go back and see the decisions that were made and see what they missed from the meeting. 
another important part of documenting decisions is to not just write down what was decided, but to also include why you came to that conclusion and any other ideas that were presented, but that you decided not to pursue. Because if you don't write down those other ideas, then you'll think of them again later and have the same discussions over and over and over again and not remember why you didn't move forward the first time. There's a question about recording your meetings. There are times when I record meetings. Um, often I will do that if it's a situation where I think somebody would want to watch the whole thing later. For example, if we're working through like a debugging exercise or how to debug something, I will record that so that people can refer back to it in a way that will help them step through the process later. If our meeting is a discussion or a demonstration, then um, I will often record those as well. We just recorded a meeting today where some folks were showing off a new testing tool. And that seems like the kind of thing that people would want to watch the full recording of later. So I certainly record meetings at times. I'm glad that this meeting is being recorded because that means we can refer back to that later. Do others record their, their work meetings? Yes, no, sometimes. I think it really depends on the meeting. Yes, we've got lots of yeses, that's exciting. One thing I think that's important is to make sure people know you're recording. That's why I like Zoom, that it announces to everyone that you're recording the meetings. Another option, oh, SP, do you have a question or a comment? I see your hand is raised. Hey, hi, Jessica. Hello. Thank you for inviting me. So uh, about recording meetings, uh, uh, I used to be a technical guy before I started my own company. And uh, then fortunately or unfortunately, I had to handle a sales team. So I remember uh, this recording meetings uh, for sales team actually is kind of mandatory because what happens, you know, the, the kind of discussions we used to have in sales meetings are completely different than the kind of discussions we actually have in the technical meetings. So though recording in technical meetings is sometimes important because we, uh, might you know miss some important points which might not have been noted down as you mentioned somebody has to note and so it is always a good idea but in case of sales actually this is very important because uh, uh, we have to pitch every day so new points comes out every day mm -hmm. so i just wanted to mention this yeah that's excellent that's a great point and that reminds me too that um our UX team at Union Pacific likes to record the interviews that they have with the customers or with the users of our products. So if they go and talk to somebody about their thoughts on a new project that we're working on, they will with the person's consent. Robin is absolutely right. I think you should always have consent from the person. They will record that discussion and that interview so that they can refer back to it later because sometimes you don't know in the moment what's important to write down, but if you watch the recording back later, you'll get new insights that you didn't have before. I also like to, uh, oh, did you have something else to add, SP? No, Jessica, that is that is all. I came to know, uh, I heard that uh, uh, the government organizations, they actually do not allow uh, to record meetings. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to take the consent before recording meetings and all. Yep, that is it. Absolutely. Yes, and Monica is posting the live meeting notes. There are also tools that you can use that will take notes for you. So we can check those out later and see how good otter.ai is at recording meeting notes for this meeting. I also like to, to tie notes and decisions back to the specific tasks that I'm working on. So not just meeting notes, but my own personal notes of the progress I'm making on a particular task. At Union Pacific, we use a tool called JIRA to manage all of our tasks. So you can create a task in JIRA and move it through different stages of development, testing, deploy, all these different workflow processes. Yep, some other people use that as well. And so for each ticket in JIRA, I can have a description of what needs to be done. And then I can also add comments that keep track of what steps I've taken to advance the ticket, any testing that I've done, just anything that I think would be helpful to know about later. For example, on that stop trains project that I mentioned, 
I have recently started looking at the difference between trains stopping just out running on the regular rail lines like you would see at rail crossings and such versus trains stopped in terminals, which are locations where work might be done on the train. Cars might come on and off. There might be fueling or inspections done. Those stops are different because they're planned. They're intended to happen, but the problem happens when those stops are longer than they need to be, when they become excessive. So there are different rules for defining stops that happen in those terminals and how long is too long versus when a train just stops running out on the main line of road. So I have a JIRA ticket to look at those differences and put them into code. And in that ticket, I've added comments about our original plans for how we were, what data we needed for those stops in terminals and how we were going to interpret that data. I took notes about when I tested what I had implemented with that data. I took notes about what challenges I found when things didn't work quite right and how I got around those challenges. All of it was right there in that JIRA ticket so I could have a record of the whole process I had gone through as I was completing this, this task for the project. So documenting decisions can be for the entire team, it can be for you, it can be for you in the future. It's important to write those things down, anything you might want to refer to at a later date that will help you continue to move forward and avoid repeated work. That's quite a bit of information that we've gone over, setting expectations, enabling participation, verifying understanding, documenting decisions. We're not going to do these things perfectly. We're going to make mistakes. Just recently, I made a mistake in the verify understanding category where I verified understanding of what data I needed, but I didn't verify understanding of when in our process we needed it. So some folks thought that it was going to take them three to six months to get us this data because they thought that we needed it immediately. As soon as a train stopped, we would need this data. And it turns out that we don't need this data until sometime after the train has stopped, which made the whole situation much easier. And we've been able to accelerate our timeline on when we can get that data. So even when you think you're doing a good job, you might discover that you have opportunities for improvement. And that's when you really want to focus on identifying those opportunities and following that final step to keep improving. We talked about retrospectives, for example, and I saw at least one of you in the chat mentioned you have retrospectives as well. Retrospectives are a great way for your team to reflect not just on the technical side of what you do, but to reflect on how you can improve your communication and collaboration skills. Ask yourselves how well you communicated, how you can communicate better. Are we collaborating with the right groups? Are there other people we could collaborate with? These are all things that can come up in retrospective. And then it's important, of course, to act on those items, to define clear action items so that you can continue to improve. I also think it's really important, especially with communication, to find opportunities to practice, to improve your communication skills in a situation that is not critical to your job. Because if you make mistakes on the job, yes, you can still learn from that and move forward, but wouldn't you rather make your mistakes in a non-work setting? I know that I would. And that's why I'm a member of Toastmasters. Toastmasters is a group that lets you practice your communication and leadership skills in a safe setting. There are Toastmasters clubs all over the world, including here in Omaha. Union Pacific has a club called Rail Talkers, of which I am a member. There is also a group called Tech Talkers. I will post the meetup link to that in the chat. And that is a Toastmasters group specifically dedicated to technologists like all of us improving our communication skills. In Toastmasters meetings, you get a chance to practice prepared presentations like this one that I'm giving, to practice your impromptu speaking, and to give and receive feedback. And for me, it's made a huge difference in my comfort level in communicating with others. And it has even tricked people into thinking that I am an extrovert when I'm actually an introvert. So I cannot <laughs> recommend it highly enough. 
And I, I like what people are saying in the chat too, repeating the point about retrospectives to add action items to your backlog. I really like that, not just defining them in the retrospective, but using that task board to, to write them down. I really, I really enjoy that idea of bringing, bringing it all together. The, the keep improving can go back to the documenting decisions and the other steps. I really like that. So I hope that these, these tips have helped all of you. Um, SP, you have a question or a comment? Yeah, Jessica, I have a question. Yes. So it's like, you know, uh, uh, most of the technical people, what I have seen are kind of uh, more, more introvert in nature. And uh, there are uh, often, you know, uh, difficulties uh, uh, of about communicating among each other. So what methods would you suggest or what are your views to increase that, you know, their participation so that they could improve upon in you know, communicating with each other and uh, things get better? Right. What are your yes. views on that? My, my best advice is to talk to them one-on-one, -on -one. whoever's kind of the team lead is probably responsible for this. So if it's not you, you could talk to the team lead first, but talk with them one-on-one -on -one and determine their comfort level. Even if people aren't comfortable speaking up in a meeting, they're probably comfortable writing down their thoughts and sending it in an email or sending a text message or having some other way to communicate. And I also like what Tammy added to build trust. That's really important too, um, showing that you support people. One thing I've noticed is that people are much more likely to contribute to a discussion if ideas are encouraged instead of shot down. So I would encourage that to make it safe for them. Yes, absolutely. Um, even if you don't like someone's idea, consider it a good idea and move forward from there. So I think the more that you can demonstrate that support of participation, the more people will be willing to participate. And if you find that people aren't participating, just talk to them and find out what their, what their comfort level is. I know a person or two who won't speak up as much in meetings, but will talk to me afterwards about their ideas and their thoughts. And so I, I think that's, that's the best advice I have enable participation in a way that is comfortable for them. Exactly, Gina. Yeah, that is true, Jessica. Actually, what I have seen is that, you know, we missed upon a lot of interesting ideas because they are brilliant people. And because of the, you know, they don't talk much and they don't come forward. So thank you for the suggestion, Jessica. Thank you. Yes, excellent. Ooh, six thinking hats. Is that a, I'm guessing that's a book. Is that a book? Uh, it's a facilitation methodology, but it's about, oh, okay. it's about uh, um, one of the things I love about it, and it really speaks, Jessica, to exactly what you were doing was allowing people time for sometimes independent thought and then group share. So you're not necessarily putting somebody directly on the spot. They have a time to think through it and then everybody has an opportunity to share. So mm -hmm. that's excellent. Yes. I've also found sometimes that people have to pre-share their ideas like they have to run it by one person to make sure it's reasonable before they share it with a broader broader group i definitely do that myself sometimes so just finding those those avenues making sure that everyone has someone on the team that they're comfortable talking to i think that will that will go a long way okay well we've already had a lot of active participation which is great but we have time for even more. And I'm certain that I have not covered all of the communication and collaboration tips that are out there. So now for the final 15 minutes or so, I'd like to hear any other tips, examples, stories people have about communication and collaboration. This can also be your chance to share some not so successful times because we can learn from failures as well. So again, to set expectations, I want to hear your communication and collaboration tips or stories, whether good or bad. For enabling participation, you can continue to type in the chat or use the raise hand. If anything that somebody says doesn't make sense, feel free to ask questions to clarify. And we do have that recording going that I know I will also be writing things down. I already wrote the six, the six thinking hats on the back of my sheet here so that I would know to refer back to that later. So who has an additional thought tip, idea, story that they'd like to share.
I, I have something and may, maybe it's just an observation, curious if this happens to anyone else, but you mentioned how you can um, request that, you know, did you understand, repeat back and so on. And I found, um, particularly with the, with the group of people that I'm working with right now, I will have an idea or a plan or a project or whatever, whatever the conversation is about. And it's almost like a ping pong game throughout the table of people repeating it over and over again to the point where as a project manager, I have to stop and say, okay, so I think we all understand, let's move on. But I, you know, it's just, it's, it's almost humorous that it, it happens. And I could have six people, 10 people at the table and each one of them will repeat it almost in a similar fashion where, yes, that, we all get it, that's great. That's interesting. I'm trying to think if I've experienced that I know that I definitely have tried to repeat the same thing more than once. And I usually when that happens for me personally, it's because I feel like I still am missing something. I have no idea if that's what's going on in your case or if everyone just wants to chime in. But sometimes, yeah. sometimes, sometimes it's because I, I will repeat because I feel like I'm still missing something. <laughs> well, it's definitely made me look back. It's, am I doing something wrong? Have I said something incorrectly? Have I, have I misled or misguided or, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely got me. I've, I've not experienced this before. <laughs> have others had that experience of too much repetition of the points? Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, this is Robin from NFM. Yeah, I've definitely experienced that. And I think it's just like, I don't know, Rachel, I kind of attribute it to people being uncomfortable with expressing their opinion or whatever. So it's just really easy to piggyback on somebody else's idea. And I don't know, it's frustrating. I, I, I don't like it when that happens. Um, but just one of the things that I've done in the past, I've, and Jessica, you've offered up so many great um, areas of feedback and, and, um, and also the folks um, putting things in the chat. So it's been great. Uh, but, and maybe somebody has touched on this, but a lot of times I'll ask people um, individually what their preference is for providing feedback. If, um, you know, they like to do that through an anonymous survey, if they like to do written, you know, chat, email, person-to-person, uh, -person, small groups, large groups, uh, sticky notes, as I think Colleen mentioned that, you know, so I think everybody has their own comfort level and you kind of have to just try to cater to all of them, you know? A place that I worked one time, Rachel, they handled that situation with humor because the team that, that we were all, you know, working together, there was a lot of that. And so the project manager actually brought in a stuffed horse and a whip. And so when somebody felt that people were beating a dead horse, then, you know, they could pick up the whip and hit the horse. <laughs> and it's like time to move on. <laughs> wow. That's, yeah, that's a heavy metaphor. <laughs> it was, it was, it worked out really well because like I said, in that particular situation with the, the projects, the, the big project that we were working on there, you know, there did, tend to be a lot of repetition and you, you have to move on. So I thought yeah, that was right. Mm -hmm. it. <laughs> that's, that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> well, you kind of have to get creative because at some point I feel like I'm being rude by yeah. trying to move that bus forward, but it's just, it, everyone, it's just a, yeah. it's like so if you noticed it, other people are probably noticing it too. Probably. Yeah. Probably. That's why it was so funny when she brought it in that we all, <laughs> realize that oh gosh that does happen a lot with us yeah that's great well this is kind of old school but i think that's really where having like an agenda comes in really handy especially if you have a time boxed so that you have you know these are the things we're gonna we only got 30 minutes folks and these are the things that we need to talk about we're gonna spend 10 minutes on this 15 minutes on that and you know some people might think that's too constraining but otherwise you get off one of these tangents and the whole thing can just go right off the rails. And um, I see this, unfortunately, at, at Discover, the, the, the meetings that are supposed to be group meetings to kind of give everybody an idea of what's going on. 
they'll get on one topic and then two or three people will just basically start having a meeting within the meeting. Mm -hmm. And those are things that need to be taken offline and rescheduled for something else. But if the meeting leader allows that to happen, then it just doesn't stop. And I, I've never seen a, a written agenda for any of these meetings. So I think maybe that kind of old school tool of having an agenda with time periods, and then someone can be um, uh, nominated to be the person that says, okay, we need to move on to the next topic. And then everybody just does it. But yeah. it's a cultural thing. You have to agree to, you know, to, to do that and to go along with it. Yeah, I like Jenny's comment in the chat to use a call out word like tangent to get people back, back on track. I like that too. And sending out agendas in advance. I will often, or at least I try to put an agenda in the, the meeting. Like if I'm creating the meeting, I put the agenda right in the meeting description. Right. And another thing, another tip that I have heard that I've tried to act on is if you get invited to a meeting without a clear purpose and agenda, decline the meeting. It can, <laughs> it can be a bold move, but if you're not clear on what the meeting is about, then decline it. And I've done that before. And somebody responded and said, would a different time work better for you? And I said, no, I'm just not clear on why I was invited to this. And then I got the explanation that I needed. And if that happened to you, there are other people that are confused too. <laughs> so, you know, it's not just you. So I think that's a really good idea. No agenda, no attenda. That's awesome, Gina. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> All right. I saw I saw a comment earlier in the chat too that I wanted to to call out. Um, that titles and departments sometimes get in the way and focusing on each person as a person. I, I agree with that as well. It's kind of funny. I think sometimes, sometimes it's better when you don't realize how important the person you're talking to supposedly is because then you can have a more genuine, more genuine conversation. I've had that experience before. All right, we've got about seven more minutes before we close things out and go to the raffle. Any other thoughts, stories? This is your chance to complain about a bad experience as well, if you would like to. Um, in some of my meetings with, with the rest of my team, a lot of times, the people who always um, had the most to say, they would be caught on first. So the, the ones that didn't have very much to say, it were at the end of the meeting and time would run out. So, um, I always felt like I was being brushed off. Mm. So I finally um, talked to my supervisor about it, how I really felt that she needed to mix it up. So it not always the same order of a week or, you know, so that mix it up so that some of the people that all the quiet ones have them go first. Right. So they end with the ones that have the most to say. Um, and it had made a difference um, in how I perceived the meetings because I really felt like I was wasting my time because nobody cared what I had to say. Hmm. That's a really good point. And that's a good point for me to take back because I often do speak first in meetings and I hadn't thought of it quite that way before. So thank you very much for sharing that. That's something I'll definitely reflect on. Icebreakers, yes, icebreakers are nice to get to know each other. Are there any times where you had opposition in collaboration or communication. I think the biggest opposition that I have seen is when people get defensive of their own ideas. And I'm guilty of that too. Like you want your idea to be the one that succeeds because then you feel this sense of pride. <laughs> you have to, you have to really be accepting of others' ideas and be willing to admit that other people's ideas are better. That's that's the biggest, that's one of the biggest challenges I think I've seen in terms of opposition. Have others seen opposition to collaboration or communication? Yes, Colleen was nodding. Do you have more to say than a nod, Colleen? <laughs> well, I, I think you nailed it. It's because you know you have pride in, in your work. And so if somebody comes up with a better idea, you might just be taking it like, well, 
you know, <laughs> it's a reflection on you when it's really not. You're just trying to do that last thing you talked about, which was, you know, improving the whole thing. And so everybody, you, you just have to be open to that. But sometimes it is hard. Mm -hmm. I get strong opposition anytime anything is implemented because change is hard and people do not like change. Mm -hmm. I saw Nezi put in the chat, cultural tones can definitely create oppositions. Do you want to elaborate on that, Nezi? Do you mean like within like the politics of the company or is there something else you're talking about there? Just by like when women, when, when you hear women speak or when you have people from different cultures speak based on what their tone is, it could be, they could be deemed, oh, you're a woman, so you're being overreactive or if you person of color, you could be being very aggressive or um, um, what do you call it? I'm sorry, um, berating, so to speak, um, when you're really just coming across as in direct, being direct and you're trying to get your information across and you don't have a particular tone to yourself, but because of the, the gender or the cultural aspect of it, you could be, your tone could be received the wrong way, which can cause opposition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's definitely something that I have at least considered for myself is how, how am I coming off? And am I coming off as, as too aggressive or other, other adjectives that I won't repeat here? Um, so I've, I've had those considerations. One thing that I've found helps is to have an advocate. If you can find someone else who's in the meeting that can um, support your ideas as an advocate. Sometimes that has, has helped. It's unfortunate that sometimes it seems like we need that, but I don't know. I don't think it's a bad thing to have somebody else who will advocate for you in those moments. What do others, others think you have advocates? Do you advocate for others? Does that, is that good? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Something that I've uh, experienced, I've been contracting for a number of years. So I've only had one like full-time permanent job for in several years. And being a contractor, you actually kind of have an advantage to being able to blurt out things in meetings because you're not all tied in with the, with the politics. And a lot of times the reason they bring you in is because they need a particular, they have a need that needs to be filled and you were brought in for your expertise. And so it's behooving on them to listen to you mm -hmm. and they will ask your input. And if you say something that's like, you know, maybe three other people in the room were thinking it, but nobody's gonna say it because mm -hmm. they've got, you know, their performance reviews to think about and all that. I don't, you know, I come in, I do my work and a few months later I'm gone. So I have the advantage of being able to say really, you know, some pretty blunt things sometimes about what I observe and they actually appreciate that because it's a, you know, it's a set of eyes outside the company oh, looking yeah. in, you know, you, when you, when you're there, you don't see it, but someone coming from the outside as an observer can point those things out. Mm -hmm. So I found that actually to be kind of a, an advantage in, uh, in meetings, just being able to say, well, Hey, I'm, I'm really not part of the crew here. Here's mm -hmm. what I see going on. Right. Yeah, and that brings up another point that sometimes having a neutral party as a mediator or an outside observer can, can help a facilitator. Yes, a neutral facilitator, absolutely. I saw one last question in the chat. What are the best ways to bridge that opposition? Um, I, I do think keeping, keeping an open mind and any opportunity that, that we have to encourage communication and collaboration to show support for others, I think that that can go a long way. Any final thoughts on ways to counteract that opposition to collaboration and communication? Good intentions go a long way. Good intentions, yes, absolutely. Well, thank you all for, for being here tonight. I know I learned some new things. I hope you did too. And ooh, it looks like we're excited for the for the wheel to see who wins the raffle. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. I appreciate it. Uh, 
the information was very interesting and I love the approach of trying different things to appeal to different people that, that come from different backgrounds and uh, preferences. Just as a reminder, this presentation was recorded. The notes have been dictated and they'll be available in Tecoma. We'll, sh we'll share that information. The raffle for everybody, and I've been trying to um, add people in as they joined and remove people as they, as they left. Um, the raffle consists of two Heartland Developer, um, Heartland Developer Conference tickets that are being provided by AIM and a $25 gift card that's being provided by CSS Staffing. The first raffle item is the Heartland Developer Conference ticket, and that goes to Bridget Brevik. Is Bridget still on? As soon as I shared it, made my screen go small. I can see Bridget. She's on. She is. Okay. Bridget, would you please put your email address and your name in the chat window and I will share it with AIM. The second Heartland Developer Conference is Heather with no last name. Heather, are you still on? Could somebody look and tell me if Heather's still on? She's still in the chat, so I would think so. Yep. Okay. And the third winner is, sorry about the mute. For the Amazon gift card is Brett, Beth Gunther. And Beth, would you also put your name and email in the chat window? And I will share that with CSS staffing and they'll work with you directly on that. Finally, thank you all for joining us. As a reminder, our next meeting is October 19th. The speaker will be Lisa McKee from Protivity. The sponsor is Echo and the topic is security. Hope you all have a wonderful afternoon or evening. And thank you again, Jessica, for a great presentation. Yay. Thank you, Jessica. Yeah, Jessica. Thank you. Have a great Bye -bye. Day. Thanks everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. Go Thank out there you. and collaborate. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. <laughs>